All right, welcome everyone. We are going to get started with this Lunch and Learn. It's good to see everyone. And I wanted to just kind of give a, a little overview of what we are going to be um, experiencing over the next three uh, Lunch and Learns, this one and two more. First of all, my name is Sherry Krieger. I'm with the Lucas County Mental Health, not <laughs> Mental Health Faith Council. I am not on the Mental Health Board. I am with the Mental Health Faith Council, a program of um, NAMI. And we welcome you to this communication skills building um, webinar with Elise Willer, who is going to be with us. And she'll introduce herself in, um, in a bit. But wanted to kind of, um, as the council um, working with faith communities and treatment facilities and practices, we know life is getting tougher with relationships and communication as we're re-engaging coming out of a hard year. And so we wanted to provide some skill building um, in communication and conflict resolution. And so we have brought this expert in um, who has wonderful experience to share with us. And we're looking really at uh, three, three things that we're gonna gain from this. One is some perspective um, and understanding the inferences that go um, into communication um, as we are talking with others. We're gonna get some tools uh, for hot button and strongly emotional conversations. Um, those things that trigger us and trigger others as we're talking. And we're gonna build some skills um, to transform um, our rightness into curiosity and which really begins with awareness of ourselves and our place in conversations. So with that, um, we welcome you to this journey of learning and I am going to open with prayer and then Elise will introduce herself. So let us pray. Almighty God, your generous goodness comes to us new every day. By the work of your spirit, lead us to acknowledge your goodness Teach us how to live and love justly and to be in true community. Lead us to new ways of thinking and being in the world that strengthen our relationships, enliven curiosity, reduce our fear and our need to be right all the time. We thank you for Elise and for each and every one on this call. And we ask, Lord, now that you would open hearts and minds to all that we might learn. Amen. 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 And that, at least we're going to ask you to take it off. <clears throat> Thank you, Sherry. That was lovely. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, my name is Elise, and I do work as a mediator and conflict management consultant. Um, is um, I spend a lot of my time um, working kind of in the middle of people struggling with their relationships, struggling to make sense of the world around them. Um, and I'm particularly attracted to the role of the mediator because um, the mediator's job is to create the space for people to come to solutions themselves. And so in addition to doing some of that more meaty work with, with people, I really enjoy the opportunities to share some of the skills and tools that I use in the mediation role to help people with their everyday conversations. Um, and so I'm just delighted to have this opportunity. We're just like Sherry said, um, we're gonna start today um, kind of unpacking why conversations are so tough um, and start thinking about moves that we can make just to unpack the really tough conversations that are in our lives. Um, the next time we meet, um, we'll take that into the emotional space. What do you do as the emotions get stronger and we start um, either feeling ourselves or feeling from others um, a lot of those more negative emotions around anger and frustration and distress. Um, and then in our final session together, I thought we would spend a little bit of time um, just sitting 
in that emotional space and learning to get comfortable in there before we move into problem solving. Um, but I would really love an opportunity to hear from all of you as we get started today. So I was wondering, as we begin our conversation around effective communication, if um, each of you would uh, introduce yourself, I'd love to know where you're calling from, um, perhaps the role that you play in whatever organization um, um, or community you're in. And then I would love a word that describes you when you're at your best and a word that describes you when you're at your worst. Um, so I'll give you an example for myself. Hopefully that'll get the wheels turning. Um, and then Cynthia, you happen to be at the top of my screen. So just a warning that I'm gonna go to you first, all right? Um, so my name is Elise. Uh, I do work as a mediator. I'm calling in today from the middle of nowhere in Vermont on the East Coast of the United States. And a word that would describe me when I'm at my best uh, is open. And a word that would describe me when I'm probably at my worst would be closed. Cynthia, you want to take us away with your introduction? Uh, you, hi there. Yes. Yeah, so I'm um, Cindy Ritter. Um, I'm an interim pastor for the Northwest New House Synod. Uh, today I sit in Cleveland babysitting grandkids. And so they might pop in. They're watching a DVD right now. Um, <laughs> just I'm going to use the first two words that came to my head. Um, I don't know if they're the best words, but um, lively and cranky. Now, sometimes I believe I'm, you know, just in great spirits and filled with, you know, good vibes. And then sometimes I'm like, Rarr. but that, and I have to say, it's, it's when I'm tired that I get cranky. So I know, I know myself and I just say, hey, I got to go take a nap. I'm a love, love naps. Give me, give me a half an hour nap and I can work back up to feeling better again. Nice. Thank yeah. you. And you said Cindy, right? That's how you prefer yeah. to go by. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Kathy, you're next to my screen. Okay. I'm Kathy Jeffrey and I am a parish nurse coordinator. I have three churches and an outreach center in the central part of Toledo, Ohio. I've been doing this for over 20 years and I would describe myself as passionate and um, the opposite of that would be tired. There's just not enough hours in the week. Thanks, Kathy. Patrice. Hi, my name is Patrice, I'm Powers Barker, and I work for Ohio State University Extension, and I'm in Lucas County, so my, my main families I work with are um, across Lucas County, I'm in downtown Toledo, where I work out of, um, and then I work on a few state projects in Ohio, and I work with Family and Consumer Sciences, which sometimes people recognize as the old home economics, so it's about helping families um, work together well in their homes and households. So. Um, I think at my best, I'm, I'm very creative and a problem solver. And at my worst, I'm, I'm very impatient. <laughs> like, let's get this problem solved. What's the problem? So thanks. Nice. Mark. You're muted, Mark. And I would love to hear what you're saying. <laughs> oh, there we go. OK. Um, Mark Bogan, I am an interim pastor uh, for Northwestern Ohio Synod, ELCA. Um, just started uh, 1st of June, a new interim at Grace Lutheran in Fremont. Uh, so I'm still in the process of uh, getting my bearings uh, there and learning names and uh, putting names and faces together. Um, so it's 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 always uh, exciting to start these you know these new uh, adventures. Uh, I would say at speaking, I think that's an a, a adventures uh, that would be a would be a maybe a, an okay best word. I you know I I I, um, I like new adventures. I'm an adventurist, um, 
and at at worst I'm not, I don't know maybe fearful of tough conversations. Nice, adventurous and fearful. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Jennifer. Good morning. Um, I'm Jennifer Wolf. I work at the Lucas County Board of Developmental Disabilities as a training coordinator. And um, at my best, I'm calm. And at my worst, I'm frazzled. Frazzled is such a good word, right? Like it really, it's almost like, and I'm not on a PR, right? It just it totally explains that state of mind. Thanks, Jennifer. Matthew, you're next on my screen. No, uh -oh, that's Howard. Oh, oh that, yes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm Howard Apps, mm -hmm. um, father of Matthew Hendricks. Ah, Checking okay. in. Uh, on one of the household laptops in Minneapolis. At my best, I am reconsidering. At my worst, I am pontificating. Uh, sorry, interim pastor at Grace Lutheran in Toledo. Great. And in the Twin Cities, just for... Vis visiting visit a couple of grandchildren and their parents. To one wonderful. Thank you. Um, is it Joe or maybe is it Bob or is it <laughs> Carl or? <laughs> you mean me? <laughs> it's Joe. It's still Joe. It was Joe the last time last we met. Last time. It's yep. <laughs> Um, I'm Joe Zielinski. I'm uh, vice chair of the Multi-Faith Council. I'm also involved with the Interfaith Blood Drive, which is this weekend at Grace Lutheran Church. Uh, thank you, Gretchen. I got it all in this time. Um, so if, you, if you've got some blood, we'd love to have some. Just, just saying. Um, the words that describe me, I guess, engaging when I'm at my best. And uh, when I'm at my worst, I'm probably a cranky procrastinator. That's two words, but I had to get that procrastinator thing in it because it, it definitely describes some of my bad behaviors. Thanks, Joe. Gretchen. I'm the parish nurse at Grace Lutheran Church. I have Pastor Abst work with him. And I guess at my best, I'm probably happy. And at my worst, I'm probably very sad. Thank you. Sarah, hello. Hello. Um, uh, my name is Sarah Schaff. I worked as the Director of Community Engagement here in Northwestern Ohio Synod. Um, at my best, I am curious. Um, when I am at my worst, I am suspicious. <laughs> nice. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and then last but not least, is it Ken or Roger or? Ken work. Okay. Hello, Ken. Hi. So <clears throat> my name is Ken Papagan. Um, I'm the I manage the spiritual care department for Promotica, and I pastor a church in Dundee. Great. And the Thanks, two Ken. words are: uh, when I'm at my best, I'm caring, and when I'm at my worst, I have a tendency to be a little bit, I guess, snarky. <laughs> Speaking of snarky. Sherry, I forgot you. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, and that was my word. <laughs> when I'm at my worst, that is, I am very, very snarky. And I would say when I'm at my best, a present would be a word that I would use. Nice. Thank you so much for this list. I, um, I almost wish that I had um, created a document so that I could show you either side. What I find particularly fascinating about this 
question is that the lists vary a little bit, but for the most part, it doesn't seem to matter where I am in the world, whether I'm in um, France or Germany or in Africa, in Ghana or Rwanda, um, down in South America and Peru, whether I'm working in large corporate settings or whether I'm working with very small nonprofit organizations, humans at their best when they're feeling uh, are, fe are, are kind and loving and lively and present and curious and open um, and regularly comment that when they're at their worst, they are um, tired and closed and impatient and cranky and snarky and suspicious and sad. Like it seems to, um, it seems to be an element of what it is to be human. Um, and so for me, the, the power of these materials and the power of effective communication is helping ourselves spend as much time as possible uh, in some of those, in those effective words, you know, moving us from those ineffective into that in effective space. And then also thinking about how are we um, engaging with others so that they spend as much of their time in the open, curious, present, um, problem-solving, adventurous space and as little time as possible in the closed, impatient, fearful, frazzled space. And so that is, that is the goal of anything that we talk about here. Um, so the, I'm, what I had thought that I would do today was share with you a visual, a concept that I use in my work with mediation my plan is just to introduce the tool, um, which helps illustrate a little bit why some of our conversations are so tough. But then, and so we'll, I'll introduce the tool. I'll tell a quick story from uh, some of the work that I do in the corporate sector as a way to just make sure that we understand some of the elements of this particular tool. And then we'll spend the rest of our time practicing it, seeing if this tool resonates in your world and seeing if there aren't ways for you to perhaps apply the tool um, in some of the conversations that you're gonna be having going forward into the future. You are more than welcome to interrupt me. You're more than welcome to, to type questions into the chat. Um, I love that you all have your videos on as much as possible. It's really helpful for me to see when you're smiling and nodding, it's also really helpful for me to see when you're frowning and furrowed browed, right? Because that means that we can go back to a topic, um, we can explore it more, um, and that's really what this, this time is about. So questions before I jump into an expo of like a very brief explanation of the tool and we start thinking about how it might be useful for you. Great. With that, I'm going to share uh, my screen real quick. Um, can all of you see a blank screen that says the ladder of inference? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so this tool is called the ladder of inference. Um, I cannot claim academic credit for this tool whatsoever. Um, this tool comes out of cognitive psychology. It was developed um, by a guy by the name of Chris Arduous at the Harvard Business School several years ago. Um, and essentially we've borrowed it um, in the mediation conflict management world because it really does um, help us understand what's going, what might be amiss in our conversation. And it helps guide our conduct um, when we're trying to explore a, a tough conversation further. So our ladder of inference is gonna start in a pool of information. So by pool of information, oop, I gotta, there we go, there we go. So by pool of information or pool of data, I'm referring to all of the information that's available to you in any one moment. 
there is so much that's available to you uh, that your brain essentially helps you out. And it selects pieces of information um, that it finds relevant. So let me quickly show you what I mean. Um, to do this, I need everyone to close your eyes real quick. And I'd like you to put your physical hand in the air. If you could remember two or three names of other people that are on the screen. Great, you can open your eyes, look around. Most of you had your hands up, that's wonderful. I'd like you to close your eyes again. Um, and I'd like you to open your eyes. Um, if, oh, excuse me, I'd like you to close your eyes and I'd like you to put your hands up in the air. And if you know, <laughs> put your hands down real quick, sorry. If you know how many t-shirts are on the screen, please put your hands up in the air. Open your eyes, look around. Great, phew. There's always a moment uh, where I get nervous that people are paying attention to what other people are wearing as opposed to what I'm saying. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting, right? Like that information is technically available to you, but your brain doesn't think it's important. And so it doesn't pick up that information. I have to say that earlier this year I was doing, I was doing an exercise like this with a group of college students and one of them did raise their hands. So I had to ask the student, I was like, how, how do you know that? And they said, I'm really sorry. I work for a t-shirt design company. And so anytime I get into a space, whether virtual or in present, I'm always looking around at the t-shirts. Um, my girlfriend hates it, right? Um, so, and what's fascinating is that um, if you think about this pool of information, the data that you have access to is going to shift depending on where you are and where you live, um, where you work, et cetera. So um, you've got your pool of information. Your brain helps you out by selecting pieces of data that it finds relevant, which takes us to the next rung of our ladder, which is the interpretation. So essentially the data is filtered through your experiences, your job, your career, um, your past life, and it then makes sense of it and leads you to the conclusions that you have in life. And interestingly enough, um, the conclusions that you have today impact the data that your brain selects going forward into the future. Pretty straightforward concept. What makes the ladder of inference interesting for me um, is that you can think of every single person on the planet as having their own ladder. So um, if we, and if you think about it, uh, if you think about the conversations that we have on a regular basis, typically those conversations are at the very top of the ladder, right? We're often talking to each other conclusion to conclusion. And so we're going to spend a little bit of time now going forward thinking about, well, if we spend a lot of our time at the top of the ladder, then how do we change our conversations? So we're spending more time um, exploring other pieces of the ladder. So just to make sure that we understand the concept of the ladder, um, I'm going to change, I'm going to go to this next slide and I'm going to tell you a quick story. I'm gonna pause the story from time to time and I want you to help me fill in the ladder of the characters in the story. So um, I have a colleague, her name is Erica. Erica does the exact same work that I do. Um, and several years ago, she was working with a corporate client. It's not super important to know what they do. Um, it's a litigation analysis firm. Uh, so essentially they help lawyers decide how much they should sue for in court. And so uh, Erica was the coach, was, a, was doing this work with their CEO. And she gets a call from the CEO and she says, Erica, I need you to come with me to California next week. I need to fire the VP of the California office. And I want you to come along 
so then it's easier for me to do so. Erica says, okay. Uh, a week goes by, Erica gets on the plane and looks at the CEO and says, what is going on? And the CEO slumps in her chair and said, well, this is when we could fly and we were actually next to one another on the plane as opposed to now when we're on opposite sides of the plane. But the CEO goes, this has been the worst year ever. I um, assigned two extremely important clients to the VP in California. And each time the VP turned in the reports uh, late, the reports were good, but they were late. Uh, in both situations, I had to get on the phone with the client. Um, it was just, it was just a miserable experience. Any and any, quite frankly, anyone um, who's turning in reports late is just not dedicated and committed to this firm. And so, the I just need to let the VP go. All right, so time out. What's the conclusion that the CEO is coming to? Hmm. If person is not dedicated to fire for somebody. Yeah, totally. So the conclusion is the VP needs to be fired. Nice. What data, like what pieces of, of tangible information is the CEO looking at? Late reports, too late reports. Too late reports. Maybe the clients are unhappy. They had to get involved themselves. Great. And then interpretation. I heard it actually when we first started talking. Um, the, like that is like that interpretation, that filter is they're not committed. Um, I can imagine that the CEO has the voice of their, you know, graduate school professor or their parents in their mind telling them that you can't turn in things late. It's disrespectful, et cetera. Great. So Erica gets to the California office um, and she goes, she's, <laughs> She very um, diplomatically says to the CEO, would you mind if I spent a little bit of time with your VP before I bring you together? The CEO says, sure, I've got plenty of work. So, the C so Erica walks down the hall, opens the door to the, vi to the VP's office, and all she knew immediately something was really wrong. The VP was in one of these like really big office chairs, and he's got his feet up on the desk with his hands behind his head and he's got this huge grin on his face. So Erica walks in and she goes, um, oh, can you still hear me? Yes. Great. Erica goes, uh, hey, what's up? And he goes, not much, it's an awesome year. Um, this is just a fabulous day. Erica says, okay, well, tell me more. And he goes, I, this has been the best year of my life. The, the CEO gave me two huge, important clients. I, um, I spent hours and hours working on reports for those clients and those reports were perfect. Every I was dotted, every T was crossed, some of the best work I've ever done in my life. Um, we did get the reports to the client um, a couple of days late, but we haven't, they have not, they haven't responded, they haven't given us any feedback. We didn't have to do any follow-up work. Um, the CEO has just flown from New York to California. The last time the CEO was in the office, it was to give my colleague a promotion. The CEO is here. I think I'm getting a promotion. Okay, so time out. Help me build the VP ladder. What is the top of the, the conclusion that the VP has come to? They're gonna get a promotion. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Patrice, what data is the what data is the VP looking at that might lead them to believe that they're getting mm -hmm. a promotion? Well, the work they did and put into the report and that in the past, a, a, a coworker had gotten a promotion. Absolutely, nice. So they've got um, the flawless reports, um, 
there is another part of the story where not only was the CEO in the office to promote, but predecessors had gotten fired for errors done. So there's another piece of data there. Um, and then the filter and interpretation um, is like obvious competence, right? In their work. Okay. So as far as I'm concerned, this is office Armageddon, right? You've got a VP who thinks they're going to be promoted. You've got a CEO that's flown halfway across the country with a person specialized in having difficult conversations to deliver the news that they're going to be fired. So if, um, if you were in Erica's shoes, in my colleague's shoes, what would you do? <clears throat> well, um, I think they both might need to step down their ladder a little bit and look at the data and maybe check their perceptions and how the other person might be perceiving the same data. Joe, do you want to teach the rest of the, do you want to teach the rest of the day? <laughs> well, you've given us this great framework, Elise. I think there's probably a reason we should be having this and work with the ladder, right? Yeah. <laughs> And actually, that is exactly, exactly. And that's exactly what Erica did. She literally on the, you know, I'm sure it was some huge, you know, corporate, beautiful space with great windows and whiteboards on either side. And she essentially created the ladder images. And she helped, um, which my understanding is that it was a really tough conversation, right? No one wants to be her, you know, no one wants to hear that either they've completely misinterpreted the situation, that they were wrong, um, that their, their work wasn't actually up to par, right? Um, but in the process, the VP, you know, learned that, learned that not only is timeliness really important, which is presumably a lesson that the VP had learned before, um, but kind of relearned the importance of that. And then the CEO was made aware of actually how much work and effort the VP was ready to put in to those reports. Um, There's another interesting thing here. The, when, since you added the two predecessors got fired for errors, uh, the, the unspoken rule here is if you turn in a flawed report, you're going to get fired. <laughs> so the, 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 the VP uh, assumed that those important cases needed to be flawless, which is why they put in the extra time and turned in the reports late. Yep. So the priorities were confused there. Now, is there any possibility of firing the CEO? <laughs> <laughs> um, the CEO yeah. is not making expectations clear. Yeah. You are to function in a way that will please me, and I'm not going to tell you what that is. <laughs> and I'm sure that there's, and I'm sure that if we were to unpack the CEO's ladder or the emails, right, that the CEO sent when the report and I'm sure the CEO would say, look, this is this sentence. To me, this sentence means I was indicating to you that it was really important. And I thought that turning in reports on time is just a, it's a no brainer, right? Like mm -hmm. we don't, you know, so I think that that, so what I find fascinating about this particular story is that at the end of the day, the CEO didn't end up firing the VP. Uh, the VP wasn't promoted either. Um, the VP ended up doing another year and a half and then they, they did receive the promotion. Um, but I think you guys have it. Um, and I think that you have it because you're already starting to think about the expanding on the very limited pieces of information that I've given you here. So I think it's your turn. Um, so it's your turn to practice. So I'm gonna give you a moment, um, pull out a sheet of paper yeah, or you can do this on your computer. Um, and I want you to think about a recent conversation that you've had um, or a conversation that you're about to have. 
And I want you to spend a little bit of time um, building the ladders, your own ladder and the ladder of the other person. I do want you to do this in a specific order. As you can see on the screen, start with your own conclusions, then go to your data. Like what are you noticing about the, about the situation or the relationship and then your interpretations. And then once you've done that, shift over and think about their perspective. Start with their conclusions, their data, and then their interpretations. <clears throat> Just do about 30 more seconds. No worries if the whole, if you haven't had a chance to fill it all out. Out of curiosity, which of the boxes, which box was the easiest for you all to fill in? Mm -hmm. Which is easy, uh, which was what, Elise? Easiest, yeah, easiest. which, yeah. Which was easiest? I, what, number one for me. Yeah? Yeah. Give me a, a, a nod if that, ref yeah, conclusion was easiest. Yes. What was hardest? I think for me, number six. Yeah. How they are interpreting the uh, how 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 yeah their their interpretations of of the data. Give me a head nod if that resonates with you as you're filling this out. Yeah. <clears throat> typically find when I am in a difficult conversation and I do, I make myself do this exercise, I typically find the same thing, right? It, it often is because we spend so much of our time like at that conclusion, the conclusion level, just kind of going back and forth that the conversations that we're having are not digging in deep enough to understand their, the information, their, the, their worldview, um, and specifically what experiences they've had in the past are like are combining with the pieces of data that they're seeing to come to that conclusion. Um, so if so if that is the so if that is the hardest, if coming up with like identifying their data and their interpretations 
is the hardest for us to do, then the best practice advice is quite simple, right? The best practice advice is just spend more time exploring their ladder, which is significantly easier said than done, right? Um, and so that's what we wanna spend the rest of our time here today doing. So I actually have, we're a, we're a small enough group that we can do this in a couple of different ways. So one way that we could do this is that one or two of you, if you felt comfortable, could share the situation that you're thinking about with your ladder. Um, and the group could help you think through some questions that you might ask um, and help you practice um, exploring, exploring that ladder. That's one option. We also are large enough as a group that if everybody wanted an opportunity to work one-on-one -on -one with one person and get some kind of some private coaching advice and some feedback on how they might ask questions and kind of unpack the other person's ladder, we could do some pairs work. Is, do you have, as a group, do you have a, a, a preference? Do you wanna to stay together and work together on one or two? Or would everyone really appreciate the opportunity to work with someone else um, on the call? I move we stay together and work on one or two. I move that. I agree with Howard. <laughs> Great. Oh, Matthew, I agree with Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, then let's do that. Do I have a volunteer or two um, who'd like to share what might be going on? I, I could do that. So we've got Mark as a volunteer. Anyone else? I just wanna make sure that we allow for enough time. Okay. Mark, um, really quickly, um, what's, can you just give us a little bit of context for the situation? Uh, context for the situation is coming into a new um, interim, coming into a new congregation and immediately seeing something that needs to change. Okay. And your conclusion um, is that it needs to change. Uh, presumably their conclusion is that it does not need to change. Right. <laughs> Great. Um, do you feel comfortable giving us a little bit more context yes. about what you think needs yes. to change? Yes, and I'll, I'll see if I can explain uh, very quickly. Uh, the, um, the information database in this congregation is <clears throat> um, in, it, it is uh, in the control of the office manager. And that person is the only one who has access to the uh, information other than asking her to for what you want, the information that you want from the congregation database. Okay. And so um, the conclusion for you is that that inf like the access and control should potentially be shared. Yes. Um, and the yes. office manager is saying, mm-mm. I keep control of the of this database. Yes. Nice. Um, perfect. So I think, Mark, what we'll do is I'm going to play a version of the office manager. OK. Um, and you're going to play you. OK. And your goal, your, your only goal in this moment is to start playing around with questions that move that would potentially move your your office manager down her ladder to get information, and so when I feel like we're back up at conclusions, I'll respond accordingly. Hmm. Um, and Mark, you feel free to um, just randomly pick anyone else from the group if you want a break. If you want someone else to just to start asking questions, okay? Okay. So for the rest of you, um, I would pay attention because you never know if Mark will choose you or not. It depends on how, uh, how devious he's feeling today. Um, but 
The second thing that I find is really helpful for folks to do is just to be um, writing down words that work, questions that work, um, so that you can, so then number one, you can kind of store them away for the future. Um, but at the end of this, um, we'll try to throw together a, a long list of questions and sentences and phrases um, so that I'll send that out so you guys will have that as a, as kind of a, an email of a place to go to when you're, when you're looking for, um, you know, an aid for the future. Sound good? Okay. All righty. So I'm going to start, Mark. You ready? No. Mm. Uh, Mark, no. Uh, I, that's not how we do it here. I keep control of the database. Okay. Um, I, um, I have become aware of uh, other systems that um, uh, have more features that allow us to uh, have greater uh, communication with our with our members, uh, specifically through emails and through um, text messages. Um, and for um, managing, keeping our um, emails up to date, um, we um, um, there are there are systems out there that available that will allow us to um, uh, merge our our. our collection of email uh, email addresses uh, to uh, and that shares automatic with with MailChimp. We all already use MailChimp, but now we have two databases. We have one we have one set of emails that are in MailChimp and we have another that's our that are that, that are in the, the the congregation database. And uh, um, and uh, I'm running out of, I'm running out of stuff here. <laughs> um, just really quick, Mark, where are you on the, where are you, where are you on the ladder? I think I'm doing, I think I'm doing the, 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 um, I'm not sure if I'm at five minutes or at six. I think I'm, I think I'm at six. I don't know. What does everybody else think? Where do, how are other people interpreting where Mark is on the ladder? I think Mark is at two. Okay, Joe, you think he's at two? Ken, you saw, I saw your hand raised. Where do you think Mark is? Oop, he's at two. Ken's like, I've got the other people in the office. I can't turn. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, nice. Of two. So going. So I. I think I might. I think I might be in agreement there. I think Mark, in your head, you want to go to the office manager's data and their interpretations. That's where you want to go. But what I find fascinating about the human condition is that we somehow it somehow gets mistranslated, and when it comes out, what it sounds like for me is that you're offering me your data and you're offering me maybe some of your interpretations, um, what you're looking at. So you mentioned that there is another system uh, that you use. You're thinking about um, new technologies like text messaging. Um, you're thinking about efficiency, right? Because you've got two systems as opposed to one system. Yeah. But all of that is what you're thinking. Y yes. Um, I'm also, but I, I'm also thinking of, <clears throat> I'm also thinking of some, of some cons, uh, maybe some concepts that information enables ministry. Mm -hmm. If I know 
the more information I know about uh, about my members, the more I am able to interact with them in meaningful ways. Nice. So let's lean into that. I'm going to bring someone else into the conversation. Um, so let's lean into that Mark's idea that the more information that you know about your congregation, the, the more effective, the more impact, um, the more of a community that you can create. And let's just use that as a way to focus in on this particular conversation. So in this particular conversation, your goal then is to learn as much about your office manager and their, like, and what they do and their perspective on this mail system as possible. So um, can I have someone else just offer, like if you're in Mark's shoes, what might you, what might you say? What might you ask? How did you choose the current system? What other systems did you consider? Nice. Yeah, it was a it was a really really long and tedious process. Um, it happened three or four years ago, and this one there was a a co committee came together and they selected this one, and so I have learned it. Thank you for going to that effort. You're welcome. Um, Maybe what all information is stored in the system? I'm not familiar with the system. Can you show me what information is stored in it? Nice. And so um, how about we set up a time and I'll, and I can show you how the system, I'll show you how the system works. Great. So we go to the how was the system selected? What does the system cover and do? Nice. Other questions that you might ask. Mark, do you want to add one? Is there a way I could have access to that data? As pastor of this congregation, it would be very helpful to be able to have easy access to that information. Yeah. Joe, you want to add one too? I saw your hand raise. Well, I was I was just thinking, uh, it sounds like this is a fairly complex system. How long did it take you to learn how to use it? Nice. Yep. Okay. And I, I, and I would say, I would say I know this system very well because I used it for 16 years. You, Mark, have used this for 16 years? Yes. Or are you, you saying that as the office manager? I'm confused. Are you saying that as you or the office manager? Um, I am, uh, that my, my own experience is that I, I have used the system that she, that she is currently using for 16 years. I know it very well. I know, okay. I know, I know what it does. I know, I know what it can do. Um, but and now, I have, and I have a question for you, Mark. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you know this system very well, are, are, are there multiple, are there ways that multiple people can use the system without no. the risk of corrupting it? No. Joe, yeah. was that a question or was that a conclusion masked by a question? Both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Mark, it sounds to me, it feels like you, based on your experience, you feel fairly strongly um, that this system is inadequate, that it, it does not, it does not meet the needs that you and that Sherry identified earlier in creating the community. Is that right? Especially when, especially when the only, especially since she is the only one that has access to the to the program and to the data. Yeah. So there's no, and what I'm saying is that there's no there's no uh, network in this office that allows the sharing of of um, of that of that data, in that program and that data. Yeah, Kathy, I think I saw your hand raised. Do you want to add something here? Is 
is there a possibility that um, this system would allow someone to access it without making any changes? So they wouldn't have administrative rights, but they would have viewing privileges. Are you, are you talking about the old system or the proposed new system? Um, what What's currently going on? What, in the, the current system? What, what the office manager um, has. The, the, the one that's being currently used. Yeah, the one that the office manager that's in control of this system that she doesn't want anyone else to. Hmm. You, these these types of systems are, are very uh, flexible in terms of, of, uh, of uh, who, who can view, who can view and, and who can edit. Kind mm -hmm. like Kind of, kind of like a Google Doc, you can you can set up viewing or you can set up editing privileges, and that's that's possible with these computer programs. Uh, mm -hmm. And it um, so that's that's not the issue here. The issue here is that there's only one person who has physical access to the program and the data. Mm -hmm. Is is that is that an issue with her or an issue with the computer system? Because you mentioned that the system, the computer system isn't networked. If it were networked, would that facilitate, without changing the system, would that facilitate your access to the system if it yes. was networked? Yes, because for the, the, for the 16 years that I used that program, I was on a network computer and I had access to the database and could do, you know, whatever I wanted with the database. Um, um, only not, um, yeah, well, yeah, I think the, uh, um, the, the Right, can I, let's, let's pause for a second. So yeah. I, I actually want to, I want to build a new ladder. Okay. So same thing, we're going to build Mark's ladder, we're going to build the office manager's ladder. So Mark's ladder is um, the, to the conclusion to Mark's ladder is one person having access to this data system is bad, right? Yes. So, right? Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so someone other than Mark, help me, what is the data that you've heard Mark say that would lead Mark to believe that conclusion? Mark doesn't have access to the data. Yeah, no access to the data, for sure. What else? If he, did have, access, if he did have access to the data, he could function better. Right, that's definitely kind of that little bit moving into that interpretation, right? Oh, but yeah, for sure. Right. No, 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 it's totally fine. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. Um, there was 16 years of experience, right? So all of that 16 years of experience is going there um, and the, the, each of the individual pieces. Um, what else? It would be possible for him to have access without changing system. Although I heard that there might be a new system he might like better. Yes. Is that correct? <laughs> Uh, yeah, for sure. And now we're back up at a different conclusion, right? Not only do we have the conclusion that this that this system should not be managed by one person, we have a conclusion that another system would be better. So I just quickly, I still feel like we might be missing a key piece of information here. If we were to go over to the office manager's ladder, the top of her ladder, the conclusion that we are clearly getting from her or him, sorry, I don't actually know, is um, that I should have control or I am the only person or it is better that I only have control of the system. Which one of those three is it, Mark, in your perspective? Uh, it, what, was, what were the options again? It's better that only I have control. Yeah. Um, that uh, I just have control. 
this is what I, this is the way it's done. Yeah. Maybe it's both. I don't know. I think it's, I think it's a control issue. Okay. So let's just say for that, for the, for the, the other, the conclusion is that um, it is better that I have control of the office management system. Yes. What's the data that would lead him or her to believe that conclusion? We don't know and we want to find yeah, that out. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think we know yet. I think yeah. that's the issue here because I think that every time we, I think every time we go to have a conversation, we're just talking about our conclusions. We're just talking about our filters. We're just talking about our data. And it's kind of like, so this is the analogy I really love. Mark, if you and I were painting a building and both of us had ladders that were leaning up against the building. And so we're, we're painting and we're painting and it's going well. And all of a sudden you see a problem and you say, oh my gosh, Elise, we cannot paint this house orange. Look at this issue. I would come down off my ladder and I would trade places with you and I would explore whatever it is that you were seeing. But in, in life, in conversation, in this conversation with the office manager, I think to her, it's as, or him, it's as if you're saying, jump from the top of your conclusion, from the top of your ladder onto mine and just go with whatever, whatever my idea is. And she looks at that 50 foot drop between the top of her ladder and the, on the ground. And she looks at you and she goes, uh-uh, and she closes off. She stops listening. She just, she might get defensive. I don't actually know what her behavior is, but I would imagine that something like that is happening. And so part of, part of the, part of the effective communication piece and why the ladder is, I believe to be is such a strong and powerful tool is because it gives us a place to go in the conversation. What is the data? What is the experience? How, to Howard's question, how was the decision? Like how, what was the process like to choose this particular data, uh, like this data management system? What has it been like for her to manage the data? Have people, has she offered up, have, has she offered up relinquished control in the past and how did that go? Um, what benefits does it, like, are there some benefits of having one key person who manages the data? Maybe it stays organized. Maybe, I don't know what she's going to say, but all of these different pieces of information feel extremely critical. One, just to understand who she is as a person or who he is as a person. But number two, if she's the, if he or she is the office manager, they will inevitably have some sort of uh, impact on whatever future data system is used and whatever interests and whatever concerns that are brought up in the conversation of the however many years of managing the system is going to be useful in the decision of a new management system if you decide to go that way in the future. I fall back on the statement that has helped me um, we don't know what we don't know. Like we, we don't know what their experience has been or what their challenges have been or, or you know, why um, they're being um, kind of, you know, um, unwilling to share at the moment. You know, there must be, or at least we would think there would be a reason for them doing it in this particular fashion. And I think that trying to dig deeper to understand might be able to help. It would be able to help. Now, I don't know anything about this woman, okay, uh, or or this administrator because I don't know that she's a woman. But 
she is, um, she is, she is, she is woman. Yes. Okay. But, but, you know, Mark is an interim pastor at this point and he wants to change the system that she's been using and he's not going to be here forever unless he thinks he's going to get to be the pastor at some no, point. I've already signed, I've already signed that agreement that I go and that's not, that's not in the cards. What that you're that, okay. So you're definitely an interim. Yes. Is that what you're telling me? Yes. Okay. So you're going to be gone. Yep. You're going to, you're trying to convince her to change to another system. Yes. Then another pastor is going to come in and he's going to change it to another system that he likes. And you see where she might not be too happy about this. And I'm just playing around with my interpretation of what her conclusions might be. I'm not even going anywhere near entrances or anything like that. But her conclusion is this temporary guy is coming in trying to change my life here. Yeah. And he's going to be gone. All yeah. I got to do is hold out until he's gone and yeah. then convince a new pastor that we ought to stick with my system. And I'm happy because I don't have to make any changes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And I'm still at the top of the ladder. And I'm yes. at the top of two different ladders here. Yeah. So let's, um, Mark, I'm so grateful um, that you were willing to, to open yourself up and to offer the situation. Let's get you out of the hot seat though. So a round of applause for sure for Mark. Um, thank you so much. We've got, um, we've got about 20 minutes left. I actually think that's just enough time to do a second, a second scenario if someone, if someone would be interested. Or have we scared you all away? <laughs> That's okay. I have an alternative. <clears throat> good so, plan. <laughs> I said good plan, Elise. <laughs> um, so in this particular situation, um, I can imagine that currently the conversation around opening up congregations and opening up workspaces is a tough topic for many for many of you, yeah? Can be. Can be, yeah. Um, so we're gonna take just a really generic conclusion. One conclusion is um, um, the church should remain outside and limited or you know, the office should remain virtual. Let's just do that, let's just do office. The office should remain virtual and the other side, nope, it's safe enough, let's open up. <clears throat> um, and I would like us to spend time coming up with as many questions as we can think of, both like drilling down, digging deeper, but then also kind of expanding that, might, that you might use in having that particular conversation. And so what I'm going to do um, is uh, as you come up with the questions, I'm going to put them in the chat, um, in the chat function. So take a moment um, on your piece of paper or to yourself, um, think of a question or two. And so let's start with um, you're exploring someone who thinks that everything should be open just as it was before, just as it was before COVID. So 15 months ago, things should be that open. And so you're exploring that perspective. <clears throat> now, is that our conclusion or is that their conclusion and we want to explore their conclusion? That's the conclusion that you want to explore, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay and you're asking for questions mm -hmm. Way, ways that you could explore their ladder the, the, with the conclusion to open up with the conclusion to open up yep 
Um, the hardest what, thing about this, the hardest thing about this is, I often find that the hardest thing about this is putting aside, um, is putting aside the, or separating, I should say, between agreement and understanding. It's really difficult to spend a lot of time trying to understand a perspective if you don't agree with it, because it feels somehow like you're giving that perspective credence, you're giving it airtime. I think I'm having trouble with how to start the conversation um, and, and where. So do, have we had a previous conversation and, and um, so we both understand maybe I'm coming from the other point of view, I don't know. Do you start with like, what was your experience over the last 15 years, 15 years, 15 months of um, the pandemic? You know, can you tell me about your experiences or why do you feel it is safe to open up? Like, I don't know, I'm having trouble putting, like how to start with those kinds of questions. Mm. And what's the, and is it just because you're afraid you won't do it right? Or is there a fear there? Or? Um, I don't know. Is it is it odd to be asking people's data? You know, like that that's mm -hmm. a different place to be. We usually are, like you said, at that conclusion level. So we already know what each other thinks. Mm -hmm. But how to ask why they think that way. So um, it, what what a what about what is going on in our world makes you think it's safe? Like, how do you say that in a way that, that is open for conversation and not, not um, or, or the other way, you know, like. Right. I don't, I don't. What about this experience has meant that everything should be closed like it, like it has been? Yeah. Ken? So if, I'm, if I'm just starting a conversation about that, I guess for myself, I would ask them, in the way that, um, how do you understand it? That way they have the ability to start however they want. How do you understand the risks associated with opening things back up? And that way they can start articulating how what their understanding is. And hopefully they would uh, present their data that they're basing their interpretation on. Mm -hmm. So I, just asking out of curiosity, how do you understand what, what mm -hmm. the risks are? Nice. So how do you understand risks? Followed by what are the risks of opening and closing? Um, Sherry, that question around what's been your experience over the past 15 months. Um, I find, so I feel like the dilemma that you're, the dilemma that we're dancing around, Sherry, is the one around asking a question that feels like it lands awkwardly so that they don't offer more data, that they close or that they are mistrustful of us or suspicious, right? Oh. Um, and I think there's, so I think there's, there's kind of two pieces, there's two pieces of addressing that. So number one is being honest with our purpose, right? Um, it tends to be that if your purpose is true curiosity, if your purpose is really trying to understand their perspective, num people get it. People are a little bit more forgiving, yeah. tend to be. Um, and I think the other piece is when we're curious, and when we're kind of centered in our purpose mm -hmm. understanding, when we ask a question that doesn't land right, we just fix it, right? Like that's what would happen if it wasn't a tough conversation, that's what would happen. You know, if I said something, um, if you said something to someone that you loved, someone that you have a really deep trusting relationship with and they didn't respond the way that you thought they were gonna respond, 
you'd be like, whoa, what just happened? And you would just correct, you would course correct. But in tough conversations, that one question feels so hard that they're, right, that we get really uptight about wanting to make sure that the words are perfect. Um, and so for me, when, I, when I'm starting to feel that way, that's kind of an internal signal that I need to spend a little bit more time thinking about truly, like, do I want to, do I want to hear their perspective? Do I, do I truly want to understand their perspective? So can you tell me how you came to that conclusion would be a good starting point. I mean, you're starting at the top of the ladder, but at least you're asking them to clarify their conclusion. Because I think sometimes we, we interpret their conclusion in a very particular way. And it isn't necessarily that we understand, maybe we don't even understand their conclusion until they can explain their conclusion a little bit more. Because we interpret that in our, with our own filters. Maybe even what makes this the right time to go into the building. Like, um, I have better luck with what questions when I'm trying to be curious. Um, are, are we assuming that the conclusion here is is surrounded by the the the, the number of uh, or, or whatever kinds of of uh, ver of um, specifics there are in terms of okay we opened up our churches but we um, required you know masks. Uh, and we required distancing. So um, um, I guess the, 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 the current openings might be accompanied by such questions are such, such questions as, um, do you have to be vaccinated to, in order to come? I mean, those, those, are, those are the questions that I guess that would occur to me um, along with you know what is the current infection rate in our in our in our area right so I think that so a lot of those are speaking to um, standards and and places of authority right like um, it quite frankly that, is, that presumes that what the authorities are telling you to do is what people want to do. And I think one of the major issues that we're having here um, is there is a conclusion, there is a difference in conclusion about the level of trust that people can put in mm -hmm. authority. So then the question isn't actually about like, what are the authorities saying? like that piece of information, then the question is about, um, you know, when, you know, how should authority impact this particular decision or not? What has been your experience with authority? Um, who are the people that you trust? Why are those the people that you trust? Um, I want to go back to the, the dilemma that you named Sherry, because there are times when I find that I'm, I'm not truly curious, like a hundred percent and it's coming out, but I still really want to understand the perspective. It's just really difficult because it's a topic that I don't agree with or whatever. Um, and I have found the three words or four words me more about to be really helpful to give me 30 seconds to get myself back into a curious state of mind. Um, I also use tell me it's it's now becoming habit so I use tell me more when I'm not feeling triggered as well. Um, but I do help 
that like someone will say something it'll not it'll you know sometimes it feels like the wind's been taken out of me right like <gasps> um and that's the go-to tell me more about that a difficulty is that if i don't already trust you when you invite me to tell you more about why I think what I think, I will be assuming that you want more information about the basis of my conclusion so that you can attack my information. Yep. Yeah. And so with that, and, and to be honest with you, Howard, they have come to that conclusion because that is what humans do, right? We, are, we all have a little bit of a lawyer uh, in us and we're regularly offering questions, oftentimes leading questions so that we can sting people later. Are, are you casting aspersions on human beings or on lawyers? I'm not sure there. Uh, that's a good question. Hmm. Hmm. Sorry. No, no, no. Um, they're just humans, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, no, but I do think that, um, and I do think that, that, again, that goes back to your purpose, right? Like if you're, if you're imagining the ladder in your head and your, your purpose is to really try to understand the perspective because it's very different from your own, the questions will sound and be different than if you are looking for information and looking for holes in their argument. Does it make sense to try to find data on which we can agree before we do anything else? So I think that's a move. I think there are some situations where absolutely coming up with some sort of setting some ground rules and as the ground rules for the decision making is first and foremost identifying places or authorities or sources that everybody feels like they can, like that they trust is a, is it can be an incredibly powerful move, um, can help quicken decision-making in the end. Um, I also, and sometimes it's too soon sometimes to even the discussion of the sources themselves, people aren't actually having the conversation. They're masking another conversation in the conversation about the sources. So um, we're gonna use Fox, we're gonna do New York Times. Oftentimes that dialogue is not actually about New York Times. It's not actually about Fox. Sometimes it is as pieces of information, but a lot of times it's not. A lot of times that's a masked conversation for a very different political conversation that's happening. So yep. if we go back to the Erica, the, the very first story you told mm -hmm. and the consultant wasn't there. Yeah. So the CEO just flew back to California to fire the person. Um, we can only imagine that she would walk in and say, you know, you've really screwed up and it's time for you to go. And he's like, what? I thought I did a great job, even though I was late. You know, that's where I think is, that's where you're trying to get us to not go to, you know, you really screwed up, but okay, tell me what happened that made those reports late when I thought I was very, specific on, you know, these are important clients that we need to treat well. Or from the VP's perspective, um, wow, that wasn't what I was expecting to happen today. Can you give me, can you help me understand what about the last year of my work performance has led us to this point? So if you were the CEO walking in, how would you start the conversation with the VP? Uh, with the VP? Yeah. Using the ladder? Yeah. I would say something like, um, sh 
Sherry, I have, um, I have a, I have a really, I have a conclusion about over of what's been going on over the past year, um, which has led me to take quite drastic measures to fly here to California. Um, and to be quite frank and honest, I've been really disappointed about the last year. Um, it's disappointed enough that at the end of this conversation, I think we need to talk about your future here with the company. And I think it's really possible that I don't have all of the information about what's been going on over the past year. And so I wanna take the next hour and I would like to have a preliminary conversation where I hear your experience. What has the last year working in this company been like? Um, what, are you, what are you happy about? What are you proud of? What challenges have you faced? Um, from that conversation, um, we'll break. And then I would propose that we come back in a couple of days um, and then have some more conversations about what your role and responsibilities here at this company should be off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. There is a, there is a really positive response to that. It might go really well. There's a really negative one that one that might have a super negative impact. Can you just quickly, what negative impact might that have? I can imagine one already. Well, you've already made your conclusion, so let's not even have the conversation. Totally. I'm done. I'm out of here is one. Number two, the VP spends the rest of the hour just telling me all of the amazing things that he's done. And so we don't actually get into the challenges, which just confirms my conclusion already. And so we come back together and I fire him anyway. Um, yeah. So maybe it wouldn't sound like that. Maybe it would sound, maybe it would be maybe it would just be come to California. I want to tell you, I want to spend some time telling you about what's happened based off of these reports from me. I'd really like to know how the report writing went for you so that we can share some information. So you, maybe you don't make it about decision-making at all. Right. <clears throat> So I get that, I, I get in my life, I'm real good at getting to those conversations. Like, oh my gosh, how do we even get to this point? But in that instance, it, it seems like there should have been better communication right after those two <laughs> instances. And I realize I don't have all the info between, oh, there are these two late reports. And now at this point, the CEO is flying out there. <laughs> totally. It seems like there should have been a little more of a clue on both sides. Absolutely. And I think that, yeah, it, and the, the story is a little bit more complicated than, than I, you know. Oh, absolutely. Would be. Um, and the number of times that I've been called in to, uh, to mediate a conflict and it just, it becomes really, it seems really apparent to me as a bystander, like where the breakdown of communication was, just isn't so for other people. Um, so, and I'm sure that other people, when they, you know, if I call up my, my aunt or when I call up my, my sister or whatever to vent about, you know, what's going on in my own life, I'm sure they're going, well, why didn't you just say that, you know, 10 days ago, why are you waiting so long? Right. Yeah. Um, I am aware of the time, um, I've really enjoyed this time together. I hope you're coming away with some more to think about. I will send the questions that we've come up with in chat and then a couple of more that I've just jotted down based on our time here together to you, Sherry. Um, and then perhaps you can send that off to folks. Um, the next time we get together, we're gonna more specifically incorporate hot topics and strong emotions. Um, into, in, into our conversation. How do we, what do we do when we're all feeling the heat? So I look forward to hopefully seeing you all in a month. When's our next time together?
Yep, July 29th. July 29th. Mm -hmm. Same time, 11.30. Sounds Same good. Link, but I'll send it out, yep. So thank you all, thank you, Elise. It was very helpful. And yes, we have lots to think, at least I have lots to think about. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Have a great month, everybody. And, and thank you very much, Mark, for uh, volunteering. That was very courageous. <laughs> well, well glad, glad to do it. Glad to do it, certainly. And, and so thanks to everyone for, all, for your input. And Sherry, you are sending link to the recording, yes? Yep, I sure will. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank you Joe. Everybody. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Cindy. Enjoy those grandkids. Absolutely. Bye-bye. <laughs> See ya.